Hello there. Um, this is Pastor Jim from Summerland Alliance Church. Um, just recording our sermon from uh, Sunday, October 1st. When uh, I came to the church in the morning, um, our sound person had told me that our, our soundboard was not working. We are currently trying to figure out what was going on, but because of our sound uh, mixer not working, we had to um, go acoustic. It means that we couldn't get any sound over our live stream. We didn't think anybody would want to just see video and, and hear no sound, as that would be kind of not very useful. And so uh, I decided that I would need to re-record um, or to record the sermon uh, here on, on Tuesday morning uh, and just be able to put it up online for anybody that is interested in um, staying, staying informed, staying engaged about uh, what it is that we're talking about in our Revelation sermon series. It's funny because on Saturday night, I had a, a stress stream about the church. It wasn't about um, the soundboard stopping to work, actually, but it was about music. I remember that I had chosen songs for the Sunday. Um, I had apparently not practiced them as when I saw them, I was uh, unaware. I had other people on uh, the worship team who were there, um, not from this church, but actually from churches past, and they had all chosen their own songs to do. Um, when the service started, I was busy talking, I think, and so the other people in the team uh, started started the music without me, and then I realized about partly through that, oh, obviously I should get up there. When I did get up there uh, and look at the music, I realized that um, I didn't know any of it. It was, uh, I think there was even a, a TV show theme song uh, that was on there, and most of the papers were not actual music or songs, but they were comic books. I really don't know what any of this meant. I don't think that there was a deeper meaning other than it was just this incredible stress dream. I had to sort of tell the church, hey, we're going to need a few minutes to sort this out uh, and, and talked amongst ourselves on the worship team and try to figure out what songs we would do, what keys they had to be in, what notes we would have to play because we didn't have any of the music. And then mercifully, that's when the dream ended. Uh, but I just remember feeling stress. Uh, my, my feelings of stress uh, in the dream and then after the dream, uh, fear, they were all strong. I remember probably most feeling worried that that people, what it is that people were going to think. I felt embarrassed for myself that I had not put the work in, worried that people were going to think I wasn't doing a very good job, um, upset about my choices for not being prepared. I had a sense of disbelief, like why would I have even let this happen? Uh, and then overall, a, a large concern that people were going to be unhappy, people were going to be embarrassed, people were going to be, people were going to leave because I had done a terrible job. Um, none of that ended up happening on Sunday morning, which is great. Uh, but I know that these dreams um, and, and these sort of feelings can are not abnormal for me to feel like a certain amount of stress and concern when it comes to the church. Uh, I can look at the church, and, and I think I'm not alone in this. You may find yourselves here sometimes too. I can look at the church through the lens of it being a consumable service that um, we are supposed to deliver something of high worth to people, of high value. The music should be uh, excellent. The, the message should be relevant and, and meaningful and, and new, maybe. That our programs should be um, top quality and, and, and better than, you know, church A or B in town. Or, or, or some people may think, oh, these things better be better than church A and B for my past, or they should be similar to this. And and, uh, and that we have these the expectations that, that these things are supposed to happen within church. And that if I don't do it, then, you know, giving will go down, people will leave. Um, and, and, uh, and so I then get concerned and worried. If I view church in this way, which at times is easy for me to fall into the trap of doing. I think what, how I want to view the church and, and how I would hope that we all view the church, but it, it's different than, than what we are told in many places, is that we view the church as a community, that we are there to support one another, um, that we are there to honor and to love God, that we are to learn together even what it is that that looks like, um, that we are to give our best, um, and that we are to contribute um, where we can help make things better, that we are to be a part of the process uh, of, of 
um, of improving our community for the benefit of our of our spiritual development, I think, and our and our emotional health and and uh, and mental stability, and that we give to the church really as an extension of our of our of our giving to God, that the generosity that He has given to us is, is what we give back to Him, and that if I see the church in this way, um, I don't feel so worried about what. Uh, a Sunday morning looks like or how it comes off is that we then have opportunity to develop our community no matter what. Um, and that always leaves me in a healthier space because how we see things, how we understand things will influence our thoughts and our actions. How we see things influences our thoughts and our actions. Like if you see life as a, as a competition, um, it, it will affect how you act in life. If you see all the other drivers on the road as people that you have to beat to get to the destination that you're getting to, you will be less gracious about, you know, people needing to get in front of you or um, <laughs> less patient with other drivers on the road. If we see um, our kids' grades as a, uh, a competition in the sense that they need to be better than other kids, uh, so that their life will be everything that it can be or should be, then then we will act a certain way. If we see work, if we see our homes, if we see our salaries as being a, a competition, it will influence um, how it is that we act, how it is that we view other people, how it is that we treat them. If we see life through a lens of what it is that we don't have, we can begin to... Um, become unhappy with the things that we have because somebody will always have more than us, whether it's housing or, um, or, or cars or, or money or even, you know, trips or, or what we seem to be happiness, but not everybody lets, lets us into what is truly going on within, within their lives. Um, but we just see the things that we don't have. If we see, you know, if we hold to a value like only good vibes in my life, I've seen that on a bumper sticker, I believe, then we can view life as something that is only to be enjoyed, that there is only to be happy and positive um, things that occur within our lives. And while this could be a good way to reframe the way we see challenging things or negative things, we can take it too far to say that then anything that is not happy or positive is to be avoided or to be cast off, whether that's people, whether that's experiences, whatever it may be. But the things that we think about this life, the lens in which we see the world through, um, gets us to interpret uh, what it is that is happening with around us, which then brings into our lives talk and action. Revelation, the book of Revelation, is not so much a book about what it is that we're to do or how it is that we are to live, but it is a book about how we see the world. It is meant to give us a lens through which we see and interpret and understand the things that are going on around us. Other than in the, the letters to the churches, chapters 2 and 3, there really is very little that tells us how it is that we are to live. But there are images and visions and pictures and symbols that are meant to influence and shape how we see the things that are going on around us. You know, when we have the image of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, where he is uh, standing in the middle of the lampstands, the lampstands being the churches, it influences us to see that, that Jesus is in the midst of the churches. He is within the church. He is a part of it. He is participating in what is going on. He is at the center. That when we see that he is a, compared to, you know, in much of the language, a messenger, he has a message to bring. He is divine. He is glorious. When we are introduced to God on the throne in Revelation chapter 4, we see within the images uh, a, a powerful um, being, that God is um, mighty that he is sovereign as he is on the throne, that he is worthy of constant worship. When we see uh, the Lamb uh, in chapter 5, we see uh, and be able and are able then to see uh, through this image that, that the way of the kingdom, the way of the Christian is not 
self-fulfillment necessarily, but death and self-sacrifice. That these are the methods and the weapons of the kingdom. We don't fight by sword, we fight differently. Uh, as we see that, that Jesus' victory is, is won through death. So how we understand, um, how we read Revelation, the way that we look at the images does help us to see things within our world. And that is a big part of what this series is about, is to help us to understand these images, which then helps us to interpret things that are going on within the world. The section that we're getting to now um, can be interpreted in a variety of ways, depending on how we see and understand um, the scroll that we see within Revelation chapter 5, but also how we see and understand God's purposes, how it is that we see and understand God's heart towards the world, how it is that we, um, do, does God love the world? Does he, uh, is he angry and, and wrathful towards the world? What is it that we see, um, and, and how it is that we see those things does really interpret what's to come. They are, the, the section that we're in, and we're not really going to get into things very deeply, um, and we're not even going to read some of what we're talking about, but they are what are referred to by some as the, the divine judgments, or others have, have looked and referred to as the tribulations, that you come across the, uh, as the scroll is being opened by the Lamb, there are seven seals on the scroll, and when each seal is broken to open the scroll, uh, there is an event that takes place. Following those seven seals breaking and those events taking place, some of which are seemingly quite terrible uh, and very supernatural, you have seven trumpet blasts. And when the, the trumpets sound, uh, another event occurs, also seemingly to be very supernatural and very terrible. And then uh, later on, those are in Revelation 8 and Revelation 9. And then in Revelation 16, we come across the seven bowls, um, which are poured out onto the earth that also bring um, plagues or, or, or more terrible uh, and supernatural things. And so as we, as we look at these and we try to understand them, um, they become a lens or how we understand them. Uh, and the things leading up to them can become a lens to which um, we interpret the events that are to come. And so I'm going to read for you Revelation chapter 6, uh, verses 1 to 14. Um, and we're not going to get into Revelation 8 and 9, and we're not going to get into Revelation 16, but I would invite you to take a look at those um, as you're able. Um, and if you're interested, just to see what it is that we're talking about, because we will refer uh, to some of the things that are there. And so Revelation chapter 6, starting in verse 1, says, As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow, and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. When the Lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Come. Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth, and there was war and slaughter everywhere. When the lamb broke the third seal, I heard the li third living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, A loaf of wheat, bread, or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay, and don't waste the olive oil and wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a horse whose color was pale green. Its rider was named Death, and his companion was the grave. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, who were to be martyred, had joined them. I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. 
Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. And then it goes on later to mention the seventh seal uh, and what happens after the seventh seal, which really does lead into the, um, the, the trumpet blasts that come uh, from there. So as the seal are broken on the scroll, events are described. Similar things continue with the seven trumpet blasts in Revelation 8 and 9, and the seven bowls poured out on the world uh, in Revelation 16. The events um, can be seen as a war, famine, earthquakes, there's the darkening of the sun, uh, stars falling from the sky, terrifying creatures unleashed, hailstorms, plagues, death, uh, and more. And one way to interpret these, uh, these events, these things that are happening as the seals are opened, as the trumpets blast, and as the bowls are poured out, is that these are all describing uh, events that will come in the end of this age that then usher in or lead to uh, the return of Christ. And that it is a set period of time. Um, that it is a, uh, I think it's usually stated as seven years, even though as I've looked, I don't know where you where that's found. It doesn't seem to be found in Revelation. I think it's by piecing different like days that are mentioned together from other sources, Daniel, maybe Ezekiel. Um, and that in those seven years, uh, leading up to the return of Jesus, God's wrath is poured out on the earth in the ways that are described, that these are literal events that will take place uh, leading up to the end during a seven-year period. There is uh, then punishment, these are viewed as vengeance, uh, and these are viewed as destruction. It is payback for what people have done um, or what people have failed to do. Uh, that it is a time of terror uh, that is that is happening before Jesus' return. And that along with this view, there is the view that true Christians will escape this time of terror, that they will be uh, raptured is the word that is used, that they will be taken into heaven uh, all at once in an instant. Yet some will be uh, left behind, some who thought that their faith was true and genuine, yet all of a sudden realize, oh no, um, it's not. And, and here I am to endure these terrible things. And these sections then become, can become frightening for, for people reading it, whether it's uh, for young kids as they, as they see this and they think, oh no, I don't want to um, be a part of this. And so I need to make sure that my faith is genuine and that I'm doing the right things and, and, and right behavior is good. But it can lead to uh, intense fear. Um, and for those of us who are older, we might then come to a place where we don't, where we would worry that our faith isn't genuine, or maybe that we, uh, as some have, have referred to, or some see who, who hold to this, that we've taken the mark of the beast, which, um, which is mentioned later in Revelation, that that some people would refer to as a as a computer chip, or or some have now lately said is is a vaccine, and that God will then, because we took that. He will punish us and force us to face uh, the seven years of terror, if not more, uh, and that this is referred to as the Great Tribulation. Now, I made this confession on Sunday, and I'm going to make this to you today as well in this video, proof forever, um, but it's not, a, it's not something that I've said publicly out loud before to um, a community of faith that I've been a part of. Um, to people who listen to me and hopefully to people who uh, trust me or are coming to trust me. And I'm worried, uh, as I was on Sunday, that some of you might not like it. And that because you don't like what I'm about to say, you may not like me, and then you may leave. Um, but I know, I don't think that my role as a teacher, my role as a, as a shepherd or under shepherd or pastor, I don't know that I am supposed to tell you what it is, only what it is you're used to hearing, or what it is that you want to hear. Uh, it seems like the Bible says that that is what false teachers do. And I don't want to be a false teacher. I believe that I am supposed to teach what I understand to be true from Scripture as best as I can. And so, my confession is, I don't believe in the rapture 
and I don't believe in a seven-year period of literal terror that people will go through uh, that leads up to the return of Jesus. I don't believe in these things. Um, I believe that there is a weak scriptural case for all of it, and that perhaps we have believed it, and now look back to find places where it seems to say it. When you come into Revelation, what I have found people say to be the proof of it is when um, the, the voice says to John in Revelation 4, come up here, uh, and that John then appears in the throne room, that that is symbolic or, or, or whatever of the rapture of faithful Christians taken. I believe there's a time in Revelation where there are two witnesses who are, are taken after they have been killed uh, or close to killed, that they are then taken away and that some would view that as the rapture. There's uh, talk of a, a seal being put on uh, 144,000 people, I believe in chapter 7 of Revelation, and that they would view this as a protection. They're being protected from the events that are to come. And so they are taken away before the seals are open, before the trumpets blast, and before the bowls um, are poured out. Um, yet it seems as though when you come across that 144,000, they are sealed and protected, but then they are referred to as martyrs, people who have died for their faith. So, so God's protection might look a little differently than us. And there are other sections in Scripture that talk about where we used to talk about um, we think that this is referring to the rapture. First Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 17, um, talk about when, when he comes, we will be caught up uh, in the sky to meet him, uh, and then we will be with him forever. And that people then refer to or think that that means that, that Jesus comes, people are then drawn into the sky to meet him, and then go up into heaven, that they go back. Whereas what is most likely being pictured here is a conquering king coming back to his home. All of the people come out to meet that king, and then together they go back into um, their home into the home of the king, which in this sense is the, the new heavens and the new earth, earth. So that it's like when the people came out to greet Jesus when he was coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, that they came out, they, they greeted him, there was much joy, and then they went into the city with him. It is a welcoming of the conquering king. And then in Matthew 24, uh, verses 40 and 41, it talks about how two people were in a field, uh, one was gone and the other remained. Um, and that we view that as, as that's uh, in a section that talks about the end that is coming. We view that as a, a picture of the rapture. Yet the context of it is that when you look at verses 37, 38, and 39, it's actually referring to, it's, it's been talking about the time of the flood in Noah's time. And so if there's two people walking in a field and a flood comes, if rushing waters come, uh, the person that is uh, rushed away is not being uh, protected or taken into heaven, other than maybe they're dead, uh, but they are then being whooshed away into judgment. And so these passages don't really make a very strong case for um, a removal of Christians from the world before a, a literal seven-year time of terror. And, and I don't believe in the seven years of terror, this, this literal time where this is going to happen, because I think that the signs and the seals, uh, the, the signs, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are more descriptive of uh, the general and universal truth of the world. The things that we always face, or uh, events that are currently or always going on, which we don't always see, which we are not aware of, because it is in another realm. And that is a part of what an apocalypse is. It is meant to unveil what is really going on, things that we can't see by using otherworldly images to help us to see. And that it is not a um, specific and limited time in the future that we are to be um, hoping we don't have to experience, but it is something that all people uh, and all people of faith face today. So how are we to understand then the things described within the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls? I'm not fully confident 
um, exactly how to interpret all of these things, especially things like the torture locus that you come across in chapter five. But I do have uh, some things for you to consider. The first thing that I want you to consider is that we live in a broken world. And that I think some of what is described sounds like the things that we face every day because we live in uh, an imperfect world, a world where sin and death uh, reign, where they are unleashed, where they are doing what it is that they were designed to do, yet they are not meant to be a part of, of God's creation. That We live in a broken and fallen world. There are wars. There are earthquakes. There is fire. There is inflation where oh don't waste the olive oil and the wine there is disease and there is famine that, that some of these things that are being mentioned really are our universal reality that they aren't a, a clue or an indicator that the end is near they are things that we always experience and that really since jesus ascended to heaven we've been within the end of things that's how scripture has referred to it and that within this life and as jesus works to bring redemption as the scroll is opened, which is God's plan of redemption for his people, for his creation, that there is suffering in this world. That Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That death still exists, but the sting of death has been lost. But that these are things that we always experience. The second thing that I really do want you to pay attention to and note uh, and that it stood out to me in my reading of Revelation and reading of other books, is that a lot of what is mentioned in the three by seven occurrences, the three, uh, the three things, the, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, all of which have seven things in them, uh, are meant to remind the readers of Egypt, of the plagues in Egypt, that there is hail, there are locusts, there is a plague of locusts, there are frogs, there are rivers that are turned to blood. There is the, the sun that is being darkened. Um, and that, that we are then to think of some of these things within that context. And, and within that context, there are a couple of things to consider. Is that God was working uh, and doing these things to free his people from oppression. To convince uh, Pharaoh to let his people go. And that these plagues were a judgment against evil and harm. And that as we see these things in Revelation 6, 8 and 9, and then 16, that we are also to similarly think of them as judgment against the evil of the world, judgment against evil and harm. Because for God's kingdom to fully come, evil must be eradicated. There is no room for it uh, within the kingdom, as we will get to when we get to Revelation chapters 20. Uh, and 21. And that some of these things that are coming are actually coming because of the prayers of the people. In Revelation chapter 8, um, where the seventh seal is broken on the scroll, it says that another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar, and a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth. And thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. That, that some of the things that are coming as well are, are, are responses to the prayers of God's people. That when the people in Exodus cried out for God because they were oppressed, they were no longer favored as people within Egypt, they were taken advantage of, they were put to... Um, oppressive and crushing work that they groaned and they cried and that those rose to God and he acted that our prayers can bring about justice that our prayers can bring about the eradication of evil uh, is something that that is a part of what is going on within this one of the other things to, to pay attention to is that there are real images here of the fact that there is a cosmic battle going on when the plagues happened in Egypt, each plague was sort of determined to be, or could have seemed to be, uh, an attack against one of the Egyptian gods, one of the deities of the people. Those, those um, images that they worshipped, whether it was the darkening of the sun, whether it was the, the Nile, which they worshipped as a god because of the source of life that it was, um, being turned to blood and no longer being able to produce that life, there was um, 
a, a war going on, really, in that sense of, of Yahweh showing that he was all-powerful, that he was more powerful than the Egyptian gods. It's what was intended to be communicated to them. And that similarly, what we come across within some of these stories in Revelation is that there is language of a cosmic battle taking place, that there are stars that are falling. Stars would have been viewed as powers and principalities, as, as symbols or, or actual spiritual beings. The sun was darkening and the moon was turning red, that there is a, a war going on that we can't see, but that we are being clued into, that we are being shown. And those are things that we will talk about uh, in the coming weeks, uh, as we talk about the dragon, as we talk about the beasts, uh, and as we talk about Babylon, that there is something larger and hidden going on is important for us to, to note as we read through the different accounts here. Thirdly, these judgments uh, are meant to redeem. They are not meant to destroy but they are meant to, from what I understand uh, and what I've read and see, they are meant to redeem. Uh, a frequent thing that you come across within the passages is um, uh, a lament or, or a comment that, that the people did not repent. Um, it says in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20, but the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. And then again in 16, where we have the bulls coming, there is mentioned twice that they did not repent of their sins. In, in 16 verse 9, and then in 16 verse 11, they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. That there is an emphasis within this on repentance, that these statements come up showing that it is not just vengeance, or maybe it is not even primarily vengeance that is intended to happen here, but it is a a drawing of all people, people from all tribes and tongues and nations to God through these different things. That, that the troubling things that are going on here are actually meant to draw us to God, that they are meant to change us, that they are meant to um, show us that we should trust in him, turn away from our idols and our addictions, depend on and bow before God. And that at the heart of the terrible things, there is a chance to encounter God. Some will turn away, um, but others will come. The good news of Jesus, I believe it says, is, is life to some, but is the aroma of destruction to others. But they are intended to change us. Um, that they are intended to redeem us. Uh, and to, to draw us and to draw others within this world to God. And the fact that there are seven of these things, and there are three rounds of them, um, as what I have read, shows that, that, what, that these things will perfectly accomplish what they are meant to do. That, that it is not a seven-year period at the end of everything that will do this, but it is these varieties of um, of suffering and experiences that we have through our lives. Sometimes things that are brought about by us, sometimes things that are brought about by things outside of us, um, the wars that are going on, um, that we, that are meant to, or there is a chance in there that we are to be drawn to God. And then lastly, I want to notice, I want you to notice that in Revelation chapter 4, we are introduced to the one on the throne. God is sitting on the throne. And he does not move. God does not leave the throne. God is sitting on the throne. And this does not mean that he is inactive. This does not mean that he is not a part of things, but that he is sovereign over it all. That whether, whether it is that he is controlling or causing it all, um, it doesn't even really seem to mention whether he is approving it, whether he is grieved by it or, or saddened by it. He oversees it. He sits in authority and power over all that is taking place. Not as one who is disengaged, but one who is involved. That he is sending, that he is speaking, but he is still sitting on the throne. And that what our discussion group this past Thursday night noticed and was drawn to in, in part of our discussion 
was that there is a rainbow around him. It says that there's an emerald shining around him like a rainbow. And that this matters because the rainbow is a symbol of God's promise and God's covenant to not destroy humanity and creation again, to not flood it. But really, if you take it, it it's not like, oh, I'm not going to flood it, but I will burn it. <laughs> I think it means to not destroy humanity and creation again. And that this is a constant thing that is around God, that there is a constant reminder of this covenant, of this promise that is around him as he sits on the throne. So while these events are occurring, these events that we have in the past translated to mean the destruction of humanity in the world. While these things are occurring, there is a constant reminder of God's promise to not destroy humanity in the world. And that that, is an, that image is an essential interpretation of these judgments, or as, as other authors have said, um, these disciplines. So what? So what does all this matter? Why, why, why does this matter to you? And I know that, that these messages have been very focused in on, let's look at what revelation means and how it is that we can read it. And I've been a little lighter on, on showing you why this matters to your life. And so I'm going to give a little attempt here to, to, to give you some things to think about. I hope that, that the visions, the images, that the symbols that are there can be inspiring to you, can be something that you use as a lens to now see through and, and that we would continue to do this to see through and understand what is going on around us. But why I think that this matters is for a number of reasons. When, when you suffer, when you face difficult things, um, when you have setbacks, when there is grief, when there is loss, you are not experiencing something outside of norm. You are not there's not necessarily something wrong with you. It is not that God is punishing you, I don't think, but that we all suffer, we face setbacks. There, there may be a need within it, uh, and maybe you've come here by your own choice, and maybe there is uh, more going on, other forces that we are unable to see, um, but there, there may be a chance within what it is that you're facing um, to turn to God again. Like there are always chances for us to turn from something and to turn to God. There's always a need for us to repent and to come into his presence. And some of what we may be suffering may be the results of God's fight against evil, sin, and death within this world. The need to eradicate evil and harm, whether it be within systems, whether it be within countries, whether it be within individuals that there is a need for um, purging, that there are things that need to be removed from us for our betterment, um, and that removal can be painful. I think it's important to remember that within all of this, when we are suffering, that God does hear our prayers and he responds to it all, that he does care about suffering, that he does care about oppression, that he does care about those who are taking advantage of others, and that when we cry out, those cries do rise to him and result in his actions. And all that we go through can draw us closer to God. It won't necessarily. That is to a degree dependent on us. But the one with the power and authority over all we face and experience is present. He has promised and he constantly remembers his promise to not destroy and to not destroy you but to redeem, to renew, to restore, and to resurrect. This is true for you. This is true for um, the people that you don't like. This is true for us all. We have a chance within the things that we face to draw closer to God. And that all pain is temporary, yet freedom from these things uh, will be eternal. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for uh, this time and thank you for this uh, means in which we can communicate um, uh, the sermon that was that took place on Sunday. I pray that you would bless uh, your people, those who have heard, uh, those who have seen, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to lead and to guide, that you would meet us in all the things that we face, that we would uh, be assured 
uh, of your authority, of your, of your sovereignty, that you are on the throne, that you see, that you hear, uh, and that you act. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God bless you. I uh, hope to see you soon, and have a wonderful day.